great to see everyone here this morning. Ask those out in the foyer to come on in, and we'll get our worship started with this song. If you would, please, let's stand. Let us be faithful, 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 Lord. Let us be faithful, faithful, Lord. Though we cannot see, you still believe. Let us be faithful, faithful, Lord. We believe in a God who is able to bring justice and mercy to all. And we promise. Good morning, everyone. Isn't it a joy to see sunshine? I genuinely thought we were stuck in England weather for way too long, uh, but it's waking up this morning, letting the dog out, seeing the sun and the blue sky. I feel like I'm on vacation. It's just great. Um, I hope everyone's uh, doing well today, and I really hope you feel welcomed this morning. Uh, for those of you who are visiting with us, I would like to encourage you to fill out the little blue cards in the seat backs in front of you. Uh, this can be your uh, gift to us a little later when we take up the collection. Um, just let us know you're here if you've got any prayer requests. And the same for members, if you have any prayer requests, um, any updates on anything, please, please, please let us know uh, what those may be. <clears throat> I want to encourage you as well to pick up your Karen and sharing. There's always a lot of information in here, a lot of uh, things going on, a lot of upcoming events. Um, you will find, and I'll not go into the detail here to, right now, it will be explained a little later. You will find a Deacon nominee sheet, um, and we'll go into the detail about that a little later. Um, one thing I do want to remind you of is uh, the combined adult Bible class. Um, it's already begun, um, or, or it's starting next week officially. 
new series. Okay, there's a new series starting next week, um, and it's something that I think will be very beneficial to everyone here. So if you don't normally come to class, uh, let me encourage you to wake up that extra hour early um, and, and be here. Uh, it truly will be a blessing for you. Um, and this will somewhat, from my understanding, connect to the Getting Out of the Salt Shaker uh, life groups, uh, salt groups as we're calling it this semester. Um, and it will be beneficial to, to both. Uh, they'll they'll complement each other. Um, I think that's all the information I have right now. Um, read through the rest of the Karen sharing, there's always more, and if you've got questions, feel free to contact the office um, or talk to Alan, myself, the elders, uh, deacons afterward. Um, we're told to be fishers of men. We're told to be the, the people who go out and live our lives in such a way that people see something different about us. Our lives, we're, we're, the world sees good as enough. As Christians, we see good as the starting place. And when we have Christ in our lives as fishers of men, we're told to go out and to be greater than good. We're told to have Christ shine through us. And so... The, the series of getting out of the salt shaker and uh, trying to be fishers of men. This is something that I think we, we don't focus enough on. I think as we share our testimonies, as we reach out to, to find people who do not know Christ and to give them this gift that the world cannot offer, the world seeks so many different things to fulfill a whole when it's Christ that will fill it. And so as we continue our time in worship, let us focus on the words. Let us listen to the music. Let us be filled with the spirit that's dwelling among us. Be standing, please. You give life. You are love.
Good morning. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, our Creator, our mighty God, as we come to you at this time, we pray that you allow us to take this upcoming message with open minds, open hearts, and allow us to apply it to our daily lives. Help us to become better Christians of yours. Allow us to love our neighbors, dear God, not for what they do, not for who they are, but because of who we are through you. We pray that you guide us, help us through the tough times, help us to do good deeds for others, and let it always be for your glory. We pray that you help us out to become better leaders to those who surround us. And most importantly, allow us to be better followers of your word. And all this we pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Jesus, let us come to Good morning. I'm going to be reading a little bit out of Mark. When evening came, Jesus arrived with the twelve. While they were reclining and eating at the table, he said, Truly, I tell you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They were all saddened, and one by one they said to him, Surely, you don't mean me. It is one of the twelve, he replied. One who dips bread into a bowl with me. While they were eating, Jesus took the bread he had given thanks, and he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take it, this is my body. And then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, And they all drank from it, and this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. He said to them, Truly I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine, until that day when I drink in the new and the new of the kingdom. Jesus loved sinners. Jesus washed the feet of those sinners before this Last Supper. And yet he loved them to the end. Those closest to him were sinners, as we all are. As we take the body and the blood of Christ, can we love sin and sinners 
as Jesus did. So as we go out in our days this week to remember that Jesus died not just for us, but he died for everybody. And that dying on that cross, he did it for everybody involved, not just those of us that sit here. Let's remember that as we go through our week. Let's pray. Dear Lord, as we take this, let us remember why we take it for Jesus dying on the cross for everybody's sins. Let's use that to focus for ourselves and the rest of the world throughout the week. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies, who then is the one who condemns, no one. Christ Jesus who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Let us pray. Lord, as we take this cup, once again, let us remind us of the blood that was shed from Jesus so that we be made mindful that he died and was that ultimate sacrifice for us all. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for you, for your sake, will face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be shepherd, to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors. Through him who loved us, for I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither presence nor the future, nor any powers, neither height or depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. At this time, we'll be passing the trays for our tithe. Let us remember that Jesus gave selfishly, that God gives us selfishly. So let's keep that in mind as we try to give selfishly back to the church that provides so much for us all. And guests, if you have a card, you can place it in the tray as it's passed around. Let's pray real quick. Lord. Thank you. Thank you for all that you provide for us. Thank you for everything that you give us every day, selfishly and willingly. Let us remember that during this week as we go about so that we can serve selfishly and willingly all week. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. My two are not going to wait. <laughs> okay, so for kids gifts, kids, you want to shut down?
all those kids are gone, so they're in, they, they can go to Praise Kids. <laughs> all right, um, I want to introduce our, uh, really getting out of the salt shaker, our salt groups. Um, this whole semester, we'll have, I think it's eight sessions or so. Um, right now, Roger's group will be led by Alan. We also will have a youth group that's going to be led by Peter. Uh, if I could have those people and the elders please stand up. If you have not been contacted by one of these people, you, or if you're visiting and you want to be in a salt group, find one of them after service and uh, they can give you directions. But thank you all. Y'all can sit down. Um, as we go through this um, session, um, I think one of the neatest things that we can do as Christians is share his gospel. And we need to be prepared for those opportunities. And as we go through this semester, that's what's gonna help happen. Uh, it's one of those things sometimes that's somewhat uncomfortable. And maybe we're not really good at it. I'm one of those, I'm not good at it. I'll tell y'all right now, it's something I will have to work at. But I think we take the opportunity and we understand how we can share our faith. Um, it's really not a, a push. It's more of them coming to us and say, I want to know more. And all we have to do is plant the seed. And God does the rest. But um, starting tonight, our uh, salt groups will start, start up. And uh, if you have not been contacted, uh, you also can look. It's in alphabetical order on the uh, glass uh, walls back here in the foyer. And you can find your name, and then you can go find that person who was supposed to contact you and call them out. All right, so see y'all tonight. It's convenient. Let's stand for this song. <clears throat>
And who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, he passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as traveled, came to where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expenses you may have had. Thank you, Jeff. I was pretty young, and we were in a very crowded marketplace. Um, people in a, it was a foreign land, and people were pressing against you. Uh, it was 1975 in New Delhi, India. Uh, it was a time when India was in one of the most impoverished nations in the entire world. And, and as you walked every street, the minute that you stepped out on the street, it was painfully clear that you were different. You were not an Indian. And if you weren't an Indian, particularly if you were some sort of European or Caucasian, you likely had some spare change. You had something to share. And so literally people would press against you, reaching uh, with a hand out. It was impossible. We had been told by uh, our guide that was with us that the minute that you give one to one, then we're, we're actually in trouble because we can't get to where we need to go. And to a certain extent, you had to become blind. You had to kind of put out of your mind what you were seeing and the need that was going on on those streets. I was a fifth grader, and it hurt to close my eyes. Many years later, let's just say around 40 years later, how's that? We made our trip to uh, Haiti just after the earthquake had hit. And again, you're surrounded by destruction everywhere. We're making our efforts to help some of the most needy people in that area. Uh, we work with a group called Hope for Haiti's Children. We continue that work today. Part of the money that you contributed today will go to help Hope for Haiti's Children. But during that trip, they wanted to be sure and show us all the places that they were doing ministry. And one of them was a place called City Soleil. City Soleil was simply the dump for the largest city in Port-au-Prince in, in Haiti. And because it was a place where no one was going to try to run you off, nobody really wanted to claim property in a dump, the impoverished had begun to build homes there. They had actually done such a thorough job of building homes that they were no longer uh, taking the city trash there. Maybe because there wasn't room for it, but bottom line is people had begun to live right there. You have no idea what people can do when they need shelter and what they'll utilize to put that shelter up. Hope for Haiti's children has a school and a church literally across the street from that area. And they wanted to take us there. Same warnings, right? The leaders of the group said, first of all, this is a highly crime-ridden area. The gangs feast on these kinds of areas, and particularly they feast on uh, the, the non-government organizations that come there to, to do good. As soon as you give something to someone in that neighborhood, the gangs come and take it. It is one of the most difficult places to ever do any kind of work. And so we park the car. And we get out, and immediately the throngs, and they're good at this. They send the children. 
to surround you and reach. Some of the reaching, I know, is not simply to ask for something, but to try and see if they can get your hand in, your, their hand in your pocket to steal something. And once again, at some level, we're asked to close our eyes, but you couldn't. Maybe when you're a fifth grader, you can do that, but when you've grown up, your heart breaks, and it just keeps on breaking. Yes, we did some outreach to the people who live in that neighborhood, but largely that outreach and that help was by sending a bus to pick them up and take them somewhere where we were uh, doing medical exams and giving out multivitamins. Can you imagine a place where a multivitamin can make all the difference in someone's life? That's Haiti. It was another day, about 2,000 years ago, and Jesus came up on the shore there in Galilee, and it, at this time in his ministry, people just thronged. Wherever he would arrive, word would instantly spread. It is almost as if they knew the boats that he would be in, because by the time he got to the shore, the people were thick and pressing against him. That's, that's the description. People were pressing against him. And as he makes his way through the crowd, a crowd of people made up of folks, many of them just like you and I, in Galilee you had all sorts of folks, people that were making a decent living, people who were really struggling to make a living, people who had high religious authority, people who weren't sure how they fit into the, the structure of, of the Jewish Worship at that time in the synagogue, all kinds of different people. And suddenly Jesus said, Stop. Stop. Who touched me? And the people laughed. Disciples kind of laughed, Jesus, what do you mean who touched you? All of these people have touched you. And he said, No, 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 no. Someone really touched me. And they began to look, and they found a woman. And you know her story. It's a familiar story. A woman who had suffered with what's called an issue of blood for generations. Had wasted her whole, everything she had in trying to find doctors. And she thought, just this one time, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reach. I'm gonna, and, and, it, and it's interesting. I'm going to sneak up. It's almost like a pickpocket. I'm going to sneak up, and I'm going to, and the text says she just touched the hem of his garment. But you see, Jesus' eyes are never closed, are they? Jesus knew. He didn't have to even see her with his physical eyes. He saw her with his heart, with his soul, with his spirit. He saw her. His eyes were opened, always open. And this woman whose need was so great that she reached, in, in reality, in desperation for Jesus. We should, in some ways, feel some affinity for this person. And if we don't feel the affinity of desperation for Jesus, then we probably don't know where we really are without Jesus. And he saw her. He saw her the same way that he sees you and I when we reach. Maybe just to touch the edge of him, because there is nowhere else to turn. You see, Jesus' his eyes were always open. There was that day that the lepers were way off the road. They couldn't come any closer, and Jesus noticed that there were lepers. And it wasn't enough to notice with his eyes. He had to notice with his hands. There was the paralytic who was let down through the roof. And it wasn't that Jesus saw that he was paralyzed. He saw that sin had a hold of him, and he needed relief from that sin. There were all the blind men, and this is the power of this miracle, that Jesus was always running into blind people, and he always wanted to help them see. He always wanted to, and sometimes it was these intimate kinds of muddy touches Parts of himself being put into the mud and touching them so that they could see. There were tax collectors. People that 
everyone else, again, you have to get the picture, when the tax collector came down the street, you made sure that you either got on the other street, turned the other direction, or figured out how to be as far from them as possible, and Jesus would walk up to them and speak and invite them to dinner. We're, we're, we're having a party, and I, I want you to come. One day, even, there was a tax collector that Jesus came up and said, I need somebody like you to be one of my special followers. I see there's more to you than just what meets the eye. There was that woman in the temple, that woman who had no place to get more money, no hope for where her next meal was coming from, we don't know who was back at home. She's described as a widow. That description isn't just about not being married. It was a, about being kind of destitute and left alone. She walks into the temple. Again, one of those people who kind of probably snuck into this area of the temple because she wanted to do something and she didn't want anybody to notice her because she wasn't sure that what she was doing was good enough. She placed her last the description of the text is she placed her last penny into the treasury box. She wanted to give everything that she had to God. And while everyone else could care less, Jesus, and we don't know what distance he's from, but from across the room, Jesus said, Did you see that? I saw it. Because here was somebody who finally decided to really take him at his word. If you'll give everything up, you'll be filled with me. And Jesus said, I noticed her. I want you to notice her. He's about to go to the cross. And Peter cuts the ear off just one of the stray servants that happens to be there. And Jesus saw him put Malchus's ear back on. He's hanging on the cross. He is within... Minutes, maybe hours, but just a short amount of time before he dies. And he sees his mother. And he sees that she's tended to. He's got pretty serious business to attend to when God raises him from the dead. He's got to defeat death and sin all in one fell stroke. He's got to go back home to God. And he takes a moment to notice this single woman who's there and doesn't know what to do. And he reaches out and comforts Mary. It's even in a moment when not everything is complete because he says, I can't stay. Don't hold on to me. Whatever's going on here is not done yet. And then, of course, there's that powerful scene that Luke records for us. Two strangers walking down the road, confused by what's happened in Jerusalem. And Jesus sees them. And he walks up and sees the faith in their heart and says, I want to open up to you what the scripture has always been saying. And I want to open up to you that what has happened in Jerusalem isn't about death. What's happened in Jerusalem is about life defeating death. Amen? Jesus' eyes were always open. As a summary of some of Jesus' early ministry, Matthew kind of puts a note together in chapter 9, and this is how it reads. Notice the language with me, please. Jesus went through all the towns and villages teaching in their synagogues. Again, a summary statement. He's, we've been read details about him doing this. We've already had the Sermon of the Mount, and now Matthew kind of summarizes. He's gone through all the towns and villages teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. And I don't know so much that it's a reflection on what has been in the past, but maybe even a recognition of no matter how far I've gone, no matter all that I've done, he still sees. He saw the crowds is the language that Matthew uses. I want to invite you to the reality that he sees in that crowd, you and me. Your face. My face. The face of every single person, by the way, that you will run into over the next day, two days, the next week. All their faces are in that crowd. Jesus saw the crowds. 
And in seeing, his heart was open and he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. You see, when Jesus sees, he sees beyond the outside facade that we put on. He looks into each of our lives. And he says, Alan, I don't know, I don't really care how good that tie looks. Isn't that a good looking tie? I don't really care. Because I know what's going on in your heart. And I know the struggles that are there. He looks into your life and he says, you know... I know you've got a really nice fat bank account. What a deal to have. I see beyond that and see that you're still longing and you're still empty and you still need something more. He looks beyond the way that we kind of put a face on and smile and say, everything's okay. And he knows that we're struggling with our identity, that we're struggling with who we are, that we're struggling. And this is maybe the thing he sees most of all, that Satan has gotten into our vision and we're not sure exactly whether or not God's love is enough. Harassed. Without Jesus and without the Holy Spirit, helpless to do anything about that poor vision. With Jesus, everything changes. Because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples. Notice he sees, but now he asked the disciples to see. The harvest is plentiful. See? There's so much work to be done. So much seed to be spread. So much good to be brought. The harvest is plentiful, plentiful but the workers are few. Ask. Ask the Lord. The Lord of the gospel, the Lord of the good news, the Lord of God's love and His mercy and grace. Ask the Lord of the harvest to send out, to send out workers into His harvest field. You see, this idea of blind eyes is kind of not really a new thing. Isaiah, when he was prophesying back about six to eight hundred years before Jesus, said things like, they have eyes, but they can't see. They have ears, but they can't hear. Jesus will repeat that on a regular basis. Whenever Jesus gets ready to say something really important, he'll say things like, those who have ears, let them hear. Those who have eyes, let them see. He's really interested in us discovering what he sees. For us to see the harvest, to see the harassed and helpless, to see those who are like sheep without a shepherd. In reality, to open our eyes, not in the sense of physically lifting our eyelids. We do that all the time, don't we? Although isn't it interesting how quickly we can kind of get distracted into things that literally are right there in front of us, But maybe we have a little text conversation going on and no matter where our eyes are, we're not seeing, right? We uh, are distracted by things pretty easily and we don't see the reality that's there. And Jesus says, open, open them. Isaiah says, open them. Because you can't get to where God needs you to be unless you open Not just your physical eyes, but the eyes of your heart. I love the story. Saul has been killing Christians. Saul says, God is wonderful and God is great and these Christians are misguided and to end their misguidedness, we're going to throw them in jail and a few of them we're going to need to kill because we can't shut them up just by throwing them in jail. I love God, and I want to be sure that I persecute Christians. Well, on the road to Damascus, a light hits him so hard that the light causes him to be blind. And he's fasting in the darkness. And a disciple named Ananias comes to him and says, God has sent me, Jesus has sent me to open your eyes. He lays his hand on him. And the language in the books of Acts is that something like scales fall from his eyes. And he can see. And I will tell you that if he had remained physically blind the rest of his life, 
it wouldn't have mattered. Because at that point, he saw Jesus for who he was. And he saw what Jesus saw in the people in the crowd. Now we're really glad that that came along with physical healing of his eyes. But the most important miracle that went on was that Saul not only, no longer saw Christians as those who were opposed to God's mission, but the integral part of what Jesus, what God through Jesus was doing to bring the world back to him. Did you notice the story that Jeff read? You have someone who's injured on the side of the road. Maybe the definition of the harassed and helpless. Can't do for himself. Has been harassed by men who overpowered him. Can't do anything for himself. A really good guy comes by. He's a helper at the temple. This is a good guy. He knows who God is. He wants to dedicate his life to his service. And he manages... The way the text is very clear, his physical eye sees him, but the eye of his heart is closed, and he goes to the other side of the road. Priest comes by. This is a guy that not only has dedicated his life to serving at the temple, there are people paying him money to do that. This is a good guy, right? And yet what does he manage to do? He manages to see with his physical eyes, but find a way to close his heart. To not understand that no matter what business he has in Jerusalem, there is no business that God has him more, needs him more to do than to take care of this person on the side of the road. It is the Samaritan that comes and not only sees physically, but sees with the eyes of his heart. Sees with the eyes of God the need that is there. I can promise you. I can promise you that in our hurry to live appropriate religious lives, that God is not pleased if our eyes are not open. Not simply to the people who are physically broken, and there are lots of people who are physically broken, not just to the people who we see is in the wrong place at the wrong time, maybe in the wrong part of the world, but literally God desires for our hearts to be so sensitive to His Spirit that we, a little bit like Jesus, can see past what someone puts on to the world to hide what their heart really needs and to step into that life, not with all the answers that we have about questions, not with all the technicalities of exactly how religious and faithful things are to be done, but to step into those lives and simply say, I see you. And because God sees you and cares for you, He has directed me to be His light and His love and His concern in your life. Jesus invites us to see. I think we have to be people who more regularly slow down and become more aware. I don't know. It might not be the worst practice in the world before you head into HEB or Walmart. or where. Uh, by the way, excuse me, students, you're sitting in, you're sitting in the parking lot, and there's a moment there where you can be in such a rush and put all your stuff together and you say, i got to hurry, hurry, hurry and get to this class because this homework is due. Or we can slow down just enough to say, God, I don't know who you're going to put in my path today and I don't know how I can help them. In fact, I'm fairly certain I can help them, but I'm fairly certain you can help them and maybe you're going to use me to help them. But I'm going to stop just for a moment to say, God, open my eyes. Before we walk into the Walmart, God, open my eyes. Before we walk, not to be prejudiced, to walk into the H-E-B or the Kroger. Any others? Arlen's. Any others? Am I missing one? To close our eyes and pray, God, to close our eyes. And pray, God, open my eyes. Maybe it's walking into work. 
And I realize you need to be about your business. This is a God-given thing to be about your business. But I also know that almost all of us in our work have a moment to stop and notice. Slowing down and becoming more aware. Secondly, Jesus has got to soften some of our hearts. We, we want to so easily and so quickly and so nonchalantly push aside the priest and the Levite that walk by. And yet, don't we need to confess that more times than not, even when, maybe you've never felt this, I, I hope you have. It's my prayer that the Spirit will do this for you. Even when the Spirit kind of says, mm, there's something we figure out a way to say, oh, I'm a little too busy today. Oh, I'm certain that I can't make a difference in their life. Oh, maybe what we say is their problems are too big for me to handle. Softening our hearts. Softening our hearts to prejudices. Softening our hearts to seeing, seeing beyond, again, that external facade. That, by the way... Many, many people make sure that their external facade says, don't mess with me. And oftentimes those are the people who are hurting the most and need us to be brave enough to say, I'm not here to mess with you. I just think that tattoo looks really cool. Can you tell me about where that came from? Softening our hearts to understand the brokenness that is not just in us, but is in them. And finally, to understand those encounters very differently. You see, the Spirit filling us and the Spirit overflowing out of us should cause us to perceive interactions with people in a different way. We're not simply consumers out there. That's what the world does with people. They just kind of are consumers. What have you got to give me today? Jesus calls us to see beyond what they can give to us. And maybe just for a minute, see with our eyes and our hearts that this person might could use Jesus' help. And Jesus might use me to intervene. So, two quick questions for you, and then we're going to pray. First of all, I want you to close your eyes. Sorry, sorry, hate it when preachers ask you to do that. Close your eyes, because I have a feeling that when you close your eyes, you can almost instantly call to mind somebody you already know who needs a little more Jesus. By the way, they may need a lot more Jesus. But all we're going to think about is they could use a little more Jesus. You know one of those people. Don't say it out loud, but I want you to, in your mind, say their name. You know them already. Keep your eyes closed. Because I want to add to that name a question mark, a blank, as it were. Who will Jesus place in our path? Who will the Spirit open our eyes to see? That Jesus, the Spirit, wants us to step into their lives so that they can know the love of God a little bit more. One known, one unknown. The known will never know the love of God unless you begin a process of stepping that direction. The other won't know the love of God unless you decide to open your eyes to who the Spirit is leading you to. Join me in prayer. Our Father and our God, we thank you for all that you do in our lives. We confess that of ourselves, we 
are the harassed and helpless. We are the crowd who can't seem to find their way home. But with you, with your spirit, with the forgiveness of sins that you offer us and the filling of your spirit, we have the opportunity to see your love, to know your love, to let it fill us. Father, we ask that your spirit would invade us that it won't let us just be still as we walk by people on the other side of the road, as we choose to continue to just see what the physical presence is, as we continue to let our prejudices, continue to let our self-centeredness keep us from seeing those who you place in our paths. Father, A name's been mentioned by all the people in this group, and I I would pray that you would open each of our eyes to the opportunities we have to simply speak well of you, to speak well of what you are doing in our lives, to speak compassion into hurting people, maybe to to speak truth into misguided people's lives. But Father, more than that, there's there's a blank on our heart. There's a question mark of who you're going to open our eyes to. And it is my prayer that this week our hearts will be open to someone who we haven't seen before, who maybe have been part of our regular circulation among people, but that we see them differently. Because your spirit has opened our eyes. And we're seeing the relationship differently. Because we believe you're calling us. Again, not to solve all their problems. Not to answer all their questions. But to simply inject the truth and love of Jesus. Father, open our eyes that we can see. Pray this in the name of Jesus and the whole church said, Amen. I don't know if you know or not, but Jesus really loves you. When he sees you in the crowd, he has compassion on you. And he has done the thing that can bring you the most good and hope and future promise of anything. He put his life on the cross and trusted that God would raise him. We believe that the history is true, that that grave is empty and that he has been raised, and that that history points to a future that says you and I no longer have to be subject to sin, no longer have to be subject to the brokenness that Satan brings into our lives, no no longer have to think that no one loves us, because of what he did and what he's going to do. Jesus sees. And Jesus wants you to know that he loves you. Won't you come as we stand and sing? People need the Lord. People
Once again, I'd like to welcome everyone here. Uh, if you're visiting here with us, we are humbly honored that you have chosen to worship with us. Our goal is that you have been uplifted, that you have been built up. Uh, if you're just visiting the Lake Jackson area, thank you very much. Let us stay around and get to meet us. If you're living here in the Lake Jackson area, possibly looking for a church home, I may be prejudiced, but I think you found it. Uh, on to the announcements. Uh, let's be in prayer. Uh, you should have a nomination form in your uh, bulletin that you picked up. You're carrying and sharing. If not, there are some extras back there on the table. Uh, at the bottom of it is a list of the current uh, deacons, just as a reminder. Uh, these men will continue to serve uh, if they choose to, so you don't need to put their names down. Uh, there's 10 slots. That's just a random number of slots. There is no limit on how many you can nominate. You can nominate one. You can nominate 20. Okay, so there is no limit on the number of names that you can uh, put down. Uh, and these are due uh, September 30th. All right, so uh, let's be in prayer about that as you uh, do those nominations. Um, and then also our uh, SALT groups will start meeting tonight. Uh, please don't let this scare you off. We're not trying to turn all of you into uh, Bible study teachers, you know, leading a home study. Uh, if that is your desire and what you can do, then that's great. But we just want to empower and encourage everyone to use the talents that God has given you to, in your way, whatever fits, meets your personality and your, your way of doing things, to, to be able to uh, share Jesus with those around you. And so that's, that we feel is very important. We'd like to encourage everyone to be there, uh, whatever time and place has been uh, set. Uh, Peter asked me to announce that the youth will be meeting at 5 o'clock uh, at his house for the youth. Uh, and I believe uh, that was all the announcements that I have. Is there any other announcements at this time? Oh, thank you. Here, I forgot that uh, we do have a gift. If you're visiting, we do have a gift. Thanks, Robin. One of the more important, how could I forget that? I'm getting old. All right, so these young ladies will be passing out. If you're visiting here with us, we have a gift for you. Uh, if you would uh, let that be known. And uh, once again, thank you for, for visiting with us. Uh, if there's nothing else, then we'll have a, a prayer at this time and then our final song. Our Heavenly Father, we just ask you to be with us today as we uh, embark upon these uh, new things, as we identify uh, new deacons to serve uh, in this congregation. Just be with us as we go through that process and just uh, put on our hearts the, the names of the men that uh, you have raised up for this, for this particular job. Uh, Lord, also be with us as we uh, strive to empower each of us to be contagious Christians, to uh, be willing in the talents and the way that you have provided for each of us to do, whether that be uh, to, uh, to stand in front of a group and to preach or to just simply uh, be a shoulder for someone to lean on when they are being troubled and Satan is tempting them and, and just a way to share Jesus. Uh, just be with us as we embark upon that. Uh, Lord, we just are thankful for the many blessings just, uh, that you have given us. Uh, we just thank you for Jesus, for his example. Uh, Lord, just let us always uh, have a praise on our lips and a prayer on our hearts. Uh, and uh, it's these things we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Would please let's stand as we close out with this final song. I love to tell.